So good afternoon and thank you so much to our students and panelists for all being here today and for the first of our three part women's leadership series titled breaking glass ceilings Nevada's women in leadership. Um, my name is Madeline Burak I'm the governor's director of community outreach and constituent affairs. Um, we have a very special program for today, um, but before we get started, it is my sincere honor to uh, welcome our governor, Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak, uh, who would like to kick off our program and say a few words. So I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to you, Governor. Thanks, Madeline. I appreciate all the students waiting so patiently in that waiting room. It's not the most fun, comfortable thing to do, which we all do on Zoom calls, but thank you for all hanging in there and uh, got a different bunch of backgrounds. So you can tell you guys are live. You're right in your homes or your offices. Or so it looks nice. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be joined by my colleague, uh, Majority Leader, Nicole Canizaro. She's a great friend and incredible state senator. And uh, you can't have a better role model than you have in Nicole. She's just absolutely, and she's an expected mom relatively quickly, a couple of months. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to work with her. Uh, I am your governor, Nevada Governor Steve Sislak, and thank you for inviting me to be here with you. It's nice to see so many bright, smiling faces, energetic for four o'clock in the afternoon, which I really appreciate. Uh, I wanna thank the students for taking the time to be with us here and thank all of our panelists for taking time out of their busy days to participate in this important program. Uh, despite March having been Women's History Month, the state of Nevada is committed to celebrating and highlighting the contributions of women all year round, every day of every year. That's why our team led by Madeline Burek is helped put this event together today. And we appreciate Madeline all that you do to help us and to raise awareness and educate all of us. Uh, we hope this can be the start of a regular series of events going forward that we can continue this dialogue and get your ideas. And uh, it's a two way street. We wanna learn as much as we wanna offer opinions. Uh, all the panelists you're gonna hear from today are incredible leaders in our state and in their particular fields of discipline. They've worked hard to break that glass ceiling and there are glass ceilings shattering all over Nevada. And we're really, really proud of that. Uh, that doesn't happen without facing adversity along the way. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of that and all the women that are here today have persisted in the face of obstacles that have come up in front of them, barriers and challenges and our state is better. Not only are they better, our state is better because of what they did and the uh, tenacity that they had and resiliency moving forward. Ensuring that we do everything we can to empower the next generation in our state is personal to me. Both of my daughters, Carly and Ashley, will always have my heart. And raising them as a single father, I made sure to provide them with everything I could to ensure their success. And a lot of that aren't material things, it's their way of thinking about things and problem solving and uh, tackling issues that, that confront them. I am really proud to say that over 70% of my staff, 70% of my staff is made up by women, including my chief of staff, Michelle White, who is another incredible role model for anyone to follow. I'm proud that a majority of my executive cabinet positions are held by women. And I'm proud that Nevada is the first state in the country, the first one to have a majority woman state legislature. And that's something that's really incredible that other governors talk to me about regularly. I'm proud to see the next generation of leaders here today with us, the next chief of staffs, the next majority leaders, the next governors, maybe the next president, who knows, but you're limitless in terms of the opportunities that present you. I don't wanna speak much longer because you're not here to listen to me, but I wanna share with you that I am committed to helping break down any glass ceilings, any barriers that may exist in Nevada because in our state, there is no room there is no room for inequality. And I feel that way on a lot of, whether it's women, it's minorities, that's extremely important to you, to me and it's something that I live by. Uh, thank you for having me. I hope that all of our students in attendance can walk away from this having learned something from our panelists. And I just wanna again, commend the folks that you're gonna see. You're gonna hear from Nicole and you're gonna hear from some other folks that take to heart what they have to say because I'm telling you something, a little tidbit of information that you can take out of this meeting today is gonna to change your lives. So thank you for having me. I'll turn it back over to Madeline, who will inter introduce our uh, panelists. So go ahead, Madeline, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Governor. We really appreciate you being on with us today. I know you've got another event to get to, so thank you. Um, 
So it is now my honor to introduce our phenomenal panel who we have with us today. Um, I should mention to our students, one of our panelists is actually in a committee meeting as we speak at the legislature, so she will be a little bit late. Um, but we do have three of our panelists with us at, right now, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. So Nevada State Senate Majority Leader Nicole Canizaro is a Las Vegas native and the first woman ever elected to serve as the Majority Leader of the state of, of the Nevada Senate. She's the proud daughter of a waitress and a bartender, and Nicole is the first person in her immediate family to go to college. She received a bachelor's degree from the University of Nevada, Reno, and went on to receive her law degree from the UNLV's um, William, S. School, William S. Boyd School of Law. Nicole first began serving her community in the Clark County District Attorney's Office, and she currently works as Chief Deputy District Attorney in the gang unit. First elected to the Nevada State Senate in 2016, Nicole has worked to safeguard and expand reproductive rights, increase access to mental health services, and protect domestic violence survivors. Um, next, we have Nevada Sports Net reporter uh, Kirsten Morin, who is a Bay Area native with a deep passion for sports that has led her to where she is today. Currently, she is a sports reporter with Nevada Sports Net and sports producer for 95.7 The Game in San Francisco. She grew up playing softball, baseball, basketball, track, and dance competitively. In 2015, Kirsten found her passion for storytelling when, where she was given the opportunity to interview celebrities and athletes on and off the red carpet at Super Bowl. I don't know these Roman, Roman numerals, but I'm sure you do. Um, and from there, she went on to report on the red carpet for the Super Bowl, for three Super Bowls, it looks like. And in March 2015, she was given the amazing opportunity to represent the San Francisco 49ers and cheer for the gold rush for four seasons. While cheering, she graduated from San Francisco State with a bachelor's degree in broadcast communications. And shortly after graduating, she worked for KRON4 News and 95.7 The Game in San Francisco, where she was an assignment editor, digital producer, and digital sports reporter. And some of the most memorable highlights of Kirsten's career have been getting the opportunities to interview Kobe Bryant, Steph Curry, and MC Super Bowl City in San Francisco, and report for the San Francisco 49ers. And next we have Sharina Dasis, who is the director for the Governor's Office for New Americans, the state agency that promotes the inclusion and integration of immigrants and refugees in the state of Nevada. An immigrant herself from the Philippines, Sharina believes that immigrants and refugees were, are inextricably linked to the fabric and success of our state. Prior to her current role, she has worked in various analyst roles for the state of Nevada's Department of Public Safety and the Department of Veteran Services. Sharina also has also international experience working in countries like Hungary, Thailand, focusing on refugee and humanitarian issues. So thank you again very much to our panelists for being here. We really appreciate it. So now that we have met our panel, I have a few questions for each of you. And I know that this is not a shy group at all. So to our panelists, I'll be happy to call on you if you'd like, um, but you are also more than welcome to chime in. So our first question is, you all have such incredible stories and backgrounds. Um, and if you could, please tell us a little bit about your current role. Majority Leader, would you like to go first perhaps? Sure, sure. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Madeline, um, for having me here today. And thank you again, Governor. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to not only reiterate how important it is that we have so many women sitting at the table, but also how important it is to have people who believe in the power of women and want to help to promote and to contribute to successes. And I think the governor made an excellent point and, and you don't have to listen to his words. I think you can listen to his actions and not only supporting so much of the legislation we've been able to pass in the last uh, session in a and a half that we're in right now with the first female majority legislature in the entire country. Um, but also when he says, you know, his staff is made up of women, he, he is doing exactly what I think we want everyone to do, right? Is to support one another and to put women in, in positions of power where we really can utilize our voices to make a difference in our community. And we need everyone to be working together towards that goal. And I think the governor is a phenomenal example of that. Um, he's a wonderful person to work with, and I'm so glad to have him sitting in the governor's office. Um, and, you know, even here with us today from Sharina to Madeline and, and Megan here, uh, you know, we're, he's, he's living, he's walking the walk and talking the talk. Um, and I think that you can't really ask for a better partner and all that. So I just, I did want to highlight that because it's not just words here about whether or not we want to promote diversity and whether we, or not we want to have voices at the table, whether or not we believe in light of Women's History Month just ending um, that women have a seat at the table and should be part of important conversations. Um, but we actually have to do the actions in order to make that a reality. And, and the governor is one of the biggest proponents of that. And, and I can't thank him enough. Um, 
So as I mentioned, my name is Nicole. Um, I live in Las Vegas. I'm born and raised there. Um, and my parents were a bartender and a waitress who didn't have a huge um, you know, educational fallback. They didn't graduate from high school. And so I always feel so privileged and, and, and quite, um, I think, taken aback from time to time that I get to serve in the Nevada legislature in my home state doing things that I think are so important for families just like mine when I was growing up. Um, so I serve as the Senate Majority Leader, and part of my job is to lead the Nevada State Senate um, through legislative processes. So we're in the middle of our legislative um, session, which is four months every other year. So we're here in the odd number of years. We meet for 120 days. We're a little more than halfway through that. And part of my job is to make sure that we are passing legislation that the legislation is moving through all of our different subject matter committees who hear everything from things on natural resources and our public lands to education here in the state, healthcare, our, judici our judiciary and our courts processes, our economic development processes, how we raise revenue, how we finance and build budgets for the state um, and how we work to support commerce and labor here in the state um, as well as our legislative operations and all of the elections, um, things that happen. So we have a wide variety of items that we take up and consider. And in the Senate, we are, um, along with the assembly, the first in the nation ever female majority legislature, which means in the legislature, more than 50%, I think we're at 52% if I'm doing my math correctly, um, women here in the Nevada state legislature. So when you're walking around here, if the odds of you knocking on a legislator's door and then being a woman sitting in that office, making decisions about how this state is gonna move forward, your chances are better than not that you're gonna knock on the door of a woman sitting in that office. And that to me is just so exciting and unique because for so long that has not been the case, but here in Nevada, we are making that difference. And so part of my job is to lead a lot of them. Most of my committee chairs are women. So they're the ones who are setting the agenda for which bills we hear and which bills we pass. My leadership team is made of, up of a majority of women as well. So the people who help me make sure that we have enough votes to get things passed, make sure that we're vetting legislation properly and getting those policies across the finish line are also women. And we've been working um, in the last few election cycles to make sure we're reaching out to women to say, hey, you know, you belong here. You belong in these decision-making places. You belong at the table and we wanna have your voice. And so I think um, those are, I think, some interesting facets about what we do here in the legislature. And I will let one of the other panelists take over from here. Thanks, Madeline. Thank you so much, Senator. Who would like to speak next? I can speak next. Sure. Um, but yeah, and, and before I start, I have to preface this that, and Madeline knows this quite well, that I don't normally do this. Um, any sort of hint or sliver that a spotlight is going to be shown on me, I normally shy away. That's just who I am. But I came here, I said yes to be on this panel because I actually like feel, I believe that it's important because when I moved to this country and I started my career, I, I rarely ever see someone who looks like me, who speaks like me, who um, have the same background as me to be on panels like this. So I think it's very important to show like, especially that Nevada is really, there's a sizable of, of a population that are immigrant, 20% of us are immigrants in Nevada. That means one out of six of you are, are Nevada children with at least one parent who grew who was, who was born somewhere else. So it's important for me to come here and say to you that you also, you know, will belong in a leadership role. That I see you, I see where your parents are from, I see where you're from, I understand what you're going through. So that's how I'm gonna preface my answer. But, and, and for me as a director for the governor's office for New Americans, it's not only professional, right? It's also quite personal for me. So what do I do? I basically have the entire office from budget to staff to programmatic goals. I, everything will is in my purview and in my responsibility. I make sure that my budget is correct. I make sure that whatever um, the state legislature gives me and appropriates my office, I make sure that I spend it wisely and on programmatic goals that can benefit the immigrant and refugee population 
in Nevada. I make sure that not only does my staff work efficiently, but they're also happy in their job. I'm very proud to say that my senior advisor, my deputy, is also an immigrant, a woman of color as well. Um, and we work hand in hand to make sure goals are reached um, in, in the capacity that we have. And um, I make sure that our programmatic goals are, 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 are done. You know, we, we really, I want really this to, for this office um, to really uplift immigrants and refugees in our state. And I make sure that those programs that we implement will serve that purpose. So it's, it all falls on me on the end, um, in the end. And, and, you know, it's a big responsibility, absolutely. But, you know, I love what I do. Um, and, and, you know, um, my, my background, where I'm from, where I was born, helps me in, in, in being in this role as well. Thank you so much, Kirsten, we'll go to you. Thank you so much, Madeline, Megan, and Governor for having me today. My name is Kirsten and I am um, very humbly honored to be um, on this panel today. When uh, Madeline first gave me the call, I was like, I'm from California, I'm not really sure how this works, but <laughs> I'm so, so grateful to be here. So currently I am a sports reporter with Nevada Sportsnet and I'm a sports reporter in San Francisco. And how do I make that work? I work about 65 hours minimum a week, which is intense, um, but I love what I do. I'm one of few women. I have worked with two other women on our sports team here in Nevada and one other woman um, on my sports team in San Francisco. And there's very few of us. And what is also unfortunate is there very, there's very few women also who are diverse too. And so seeing this group of women and seeing that everybody is diverse on here really just makes my heart happy. I grew up um, uh, in San Leandro. So that's on the border of Oakland in the Bay Area and went to San Leandro High and went graduated from San Francisco State. And so um, I just, for me, what, what I do day in and day out is I tell people stories and every athlete to me has a story aside from just numbers on, you know, a box score, aside from what they did last night's game, they grew up somewhere. They have parents who, who I just learned about one um, Nevada softball player where you would never know, but she was, she was, she was raised by just her single mom and her father was murdered. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, why don't you tell that story? And so it's my job when I got here to find women who I was passionate about and these athletes and their stories. And so not, not that I was told I had to just focus on women. I focus on men as well too. But to me, women don't get their story shared enough as we recently saw in the NCAA tournament. Women were, were not treated equally as men were. And so I made it a priority when I got here that I'm gonna focus I'm going to put a little bit more effort into the women stories because I want their stories to be heard. So I really love what I do. Um, I make audio graphics and I write a lot. I mean, half this, I, I'm probably on camera for maybe three minutes of the day and the rest of the day is spent writing and researching. And not only that, but I have to prove myself because I'm in a male dominated industry. Everybody I work with is men. And so, and, and unfortunately, a lot of who watches sport is predominantly men. And there is a statistic that that yes, women are watching, but I have to prove to the men also who are watching and they don't, they don't trust what I say, right? So I have to kind of show up a little bit more every time and prove that I can do it. Just like the other panelists I'm sure here today have had to face those same obstacles that I have, but um, I'm truly honored and, and I, I talk and work in sports and, um, and I love it. And thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. So my next question is, um, what have been some of the challenges you faced along the way toward becoming a woman in your role? I'm sure there are many. Um, so uh, I'm not sure who would like to go first. I can go ahead. Um, sure. The most recent, um, I would say, obstacle that I had was I had a coworker who was the same position as I was, not, curr not currently um, in the jobs that I'm in now, was getting paid more than, than I was. Same title. Same, did the same thing every day and him and I are friends. And not to say that I advise ever in your work professions, you should be talking about money behind closed doors, right? That's very private, but come to find out he was making more than, than I was making. And I was terrified. I was so scared to go to my boss and say, hey, like, why is this? We got hired at the same time. We do the same thing. We work the same hours. And I will, I will be honest and say the conversation didn't go well. The manager got defensive and I had to think of the bigger picture. And I said, okay, I can go to HR. I could probably file a case and get more money back because I knew he was getting more. But I thought at the end of the day, you know, do what's what, what's right, right? Do I burn the relationship with the company that I have and maybe lose out on an opportunity 
And so that obstacle really stuck with me for, it was, it was a few, really hard few months. And so I decided personally to let it go and just let my work show. I went on, I ended up getting this job. And so by not saying anything, yes, I felt like I probably should have, right? But at the end of the day, I was like, it was a hard obstacle to know that there's gonna be a lot more like that. That, you know, someone's gonna get paid more than me because they're a man, because they're a white man, because they're stuff that's not right. But I have to, I had to learn how to just steer my way and prove prove to my leaders and prove to my colleagues that I, I, I can do this job. And so for me, that was probably the hardest obstacle I had to face when it came to knowing when was the right time to speak up and, or just letting, and knowing the right time of just winning, letting your work prove itself. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Trina. Um, so for me, I think it's important also to note that, you know, challenges um, that come to women, there's also a, an aspect of intersectionality here because yes, as a woman, of course, it's hard for me to be taken seriously sometimes when I'm at the table. But as a woman of color, it's equally as hard for me to be really even at that table, to be even invited to be at that table as an immigrant, as a woman of color. So it's it's really, you know, hard. It's, defi it's definitely different levels of glass ceilings that I had to break so that I could be taken seriously where I am right now. So what I did, um, and I think it's very important to share is that I developed my voice. And it is hard for me as an Asian woman, as an immigrant, to use that voice that I developed because I've been taught to just, you know, work hard in this country, put your head down and don't rock the boat. But sometimes you have to rock the boat um, in order to achieve what you want to. So I did, it's scary at first because people say, you know, what does she know? You know, you're not even from here, right? Um, but, you know, when you develop the voice and use it, it's, it's really practice, I think, eventually, that you, 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 you can, you know, get up and, and, and say, you know, I think it's, and you don't think it's better. I know it's better to do this way, to do this program this way, to, to find a solution this way. And, and to develop that voice is hard. It takes constant reminder of myself to say, yeah, I belong here, you know, I belong in this space. But once you, you do that, I, I think it's it's very empowering um, to, to, to use it. Thank you so much, Senator. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things is um, when you talk about, you know, running for office and, and then serving in a legislative body where the constituents who you represent or the folks who are electing you, when we're talking to candidates, and I will put myself in that category too, um, when someone says, you know, well, you should you should run for office, um, and mine mine kind of came about as a result of, you know, I was like, well, someone in Carson City should be, you know, fighting for public education. Someone in Carson City should be fighting for working families. Those were two things that that absolutely made a difference in why it is that I get to do the job that I that I love so much here. Um, and in my and in my day job was opportunities for working families and a good strong public education that allowed for me to achieve things that, that my parents didn't have the opportunity to do. And so when I kept saying, well, someone in Carson City should do this, um, eventually someone said to me, well, why not you? And I said, oh, gosh, I'm not talking about me. Um, you know, who would want someone like me serving in the legislature? I, you know, no, no, you got to find somebody who can you know, do this job. Um, and that is very common with women who are thinking about or would be good candidates to run for office. And when um, we talk to candidates, you know, it, it's the saying is that you ask a woman if she wants to run for office and she questions whether or not she is qualified enough to do the job. If you ask a man if he wants to run for office, he assumes he is qualified and instead wants to know how much it pays. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not an invalid question, but it speaks to, I think, some of the environment that exists and some of the challenges with really getting women to come and sit at the legislative table, right? There's this initial hurdle that you have to overcome personally, and that I think we have to overcome as a community to where it's not a question of whether a woman would be qualified, right? They don't have to come in and prove uh, that they have done certain things in life that would qualify them enough to have an opinion about whether or not public education is important. Um, and I think that's something that I definitely faced 
when I thought about potentially running for office, I thought to myself, well, why would you be interested in someone like me? And of course, reflecting back now and having talked to so many other women who want to come and do legislative work, who are passionate about issues that really do impact their neighbors, their friends, and their family, I think about it and say, well, you know, I went through the public education system in the state of Nevada. My parents were minimum wage workers here in the state of Nevada. So I know some of the hardships that come along with that and, and living paycheck to paycheck and being on free and reduced lunch and, and struggling to sometimes, you know, find a new job when one gets let go. I know what it's like to try to go to college from high school where you're not even sure what a FAFSA is when they say you have to fill one out and not sure how to apply for college. Um, I also went to college up in Reno on a state-sponsored scholarship um, from legislators who believed in kids like me being able to go to higher education. Um, and I got to learn a lot there. And then you know, they built a law school down in Las Vegas. So I got to pursue the thing that I've been wanting to do since I was a very young child. Um, and, and after that, I had to go out and find a job in the middle of a recession where they weren't hiring lawyers and they didn't want, you know, if you didn't know somebody who knew somebody, it would, you could almost not find a job. I almost went back to waiting tables because it was so difficult in the job market in the middle of the recession. Um, and eventually was lucky enough to find a job where now I get to serve my community and I talk to people every single day um, and have some aspects of the criminal justice system that I can bring to the table as well. And so, you know, I think when you look inside of yourself, we all have a lot of qualifications that we just don't see because we have been taught that if it's not on a, if not, if it's not a certain way on a piece of paper, then you don't have what it takes. And I think we do have what it takes, but trying to get to that point of acknowledging that and accepting that can be very difficult um, and ultimately can be an obstacle to why we haven't seen as many women in public office or in positions of leadership. Thank you. So